Just a quick word from our sponsor, Pattern Life. I am so excited to get the word out about Pattern because one thing I learned the hard way was disability insurance. For me, researching insurance got complicated, time consuming, and for me, I just got overwhelmed and trusted that my employer had some type of disability insurance, but boy, was I wrong in terms of what those details entailed. Pattern is great because it's actually geared towards clinicians and doctors and has helped thousands of doctors find and understand the insurance they're buying. You just click on the link in the show notes. I did this the other day. It takes two minutes to write your info, request quotes to compare them, or schedule a quick 15-minute phone call and buy risk-free. So request your quote today at patternlife.com so you can use your time better, save money, and be prepared for the unknowns of the future. Don't make mistakes like me and be confident that your family and income are protected no matter what the future holds. And with that, let's get back into the episode. Hi, everyone. Before we get into today's episode, we are thrilled to have Ambas as our sponsor for the episode. Hi, guys. My name is Virginia Velez Quinones. I am a University of Miami JFK um, internal medicine resident. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why I like Ambos because literally since the beginning of residency, I use it all the time. Even with like stroke CBA, it tells you like allow permissive hypertension for the first 24 hours if it's ischemic, you know, CT brain to make sure it's not hemorrhagic before you do anything, giving anticoagulation, things like that. Yeah. Do you find that like you still go on up to date to like double check or like you don't use up at all? I use it, but when, when I want the, like the latest, latest research, I'll go to up to date and like confirm it. But to be honest, 90%, 99% of the time, Amboss has the latest information and it's quick. And I have so many patients coming in all the time and I sometimes don't have time to sit down during work hours and like read the whole thing. And Coriam listeners can get a one month free trial using the code Coriam dash Amboss. We'll link all that in the show notes for you. And with that, cue the intro. I was at Home Depot getting some plumbing stuff and there's this giant wall of all these pipes and like L band, T band, this to this adapter. And I was like, oh my God, this is what it feels like for people when they go into that respiratory therapy supply room right? Like I feel like an idiot buying plumbing supplies. And until you've actually like gotten comfortable with all of these things, it's like, oh my God, which one of these do I need? You know, which one of these goes with which one? That's Dr. Nick Mark, a Seattle intensivist and creator of the ICU One Patron and contributor to the Core I Am POCUS series. Welcome to the Core I Am Thigh Pearls podcast, bringing you high yield evidence-based pearls. I'm Dr. Sheree Trevetti, an internist at BIDMC. And today I'm joined by... Hi, I'm Matt Tsai, second year internal medicine resident at BIDMC. And I am Tim Rowe, a pulmonary and critical care fellow at Northwestern in Chicago. And I am so glad to be back and to cover a topic so near and dear to every pulmonologist, tracheostomies. Let's get started with what we'll be covering today. Test yourself by pausing after each of these five questions. Remember, the more you test yourself, the deeper your learning gains. Pearl one, trach basics. What are the main components of a tracheostomy tube? Pearl 2, bedside triage and complications. What are the three main complications with tracheostomies and how does the timing of trach placement affect how you manage these complications? Pearl 3, airway clearance. What airway clearance therapies should we reach for? And which ones should we avoid in patients with tracheostomies? Pearl 4, phonation. How do we assess readiness for speech? How does a speaking valve work? Pearl 5, decannulation. What are the steps towards tracheostomy removal or decannulation? Matt, Tim... I got to be honest with you guys, every time a patient that gets admitted with a trach in their one-liner, kind of do a little prayer that there's no trach complications on my watch. Oh man, I'd be lying if I said I'd never had the same thought. Uh, I got to say though, before I started my poem fellowship, trachs were just kind of like a black box to me. And it seriously does not have to be that way. I think the best place for us to start might be with some basics. So what is a tracheostomy? 
So a trach is a definitive surgical airway that bypasses the upper airways, the nasopharynx and the oropharynx. Okay. So a tracheostomy, or as we will refer to as a trach in this episode, is a way to deliver oxygen and ventilate more directly without having to go through the nasal oropharynx and larynx like we typically do with endotracheal intubation. So it's useful if you are talking to a respiratory therapist and they ask you what tube. If you know all of that, you're a hero. You'll tell them exactly what to get out of their supply room. Oh man, I still remember when I was an intern and an interventional pulmonologist was asking me about someone's trach and me fumbling through the words I saw on that one liner. Oh, seven Shiley, XLT, pretending like I knew what <laughs> any of those actually meant. Ugh, the struggle. Yeah. Um, well, let's just start with that first number that you said, Treya. Trachs are actually assigned numbers, uh, in the case of your trach, uh, seven, and those numbers correlate with their sizes. It's also useful because let's say somebody has a, a 5, 5.0 tube, you might want to get one size smaller too. Because if you have trouble getting, the, getting a new 5 in, a 4 will, will certainly fit. So uh, for most common numbering conventions, the tube number is the inner diameter of the outer cannula. And don't worry if I just lost you there, we're going to clarify all that nomenclature in just a second. Not to get bogged down in semantics, uh, but some manufacturers like Shiley use a different numbering convention, which does not have the one-to-one -one relationship between number and inner diameter, but still in that case, the correlation's there. We're going to link a, a nifty tool in the show notes that you can use to compare different trach sizes on the fly. Speaking of Shiley, you know, I think I've like heard and written that maybe like a thousand times, and I don't think I fully appreciate that Shiley is just a trach manufacturer. There's quite a few trach manufacturers out there, but the two that we see most frequently, at least in my shop, are Shiley and Portex. So it's helpful to have that information ready when you're troubleshooting with your friendly neighborhood respiratory therapist or your pulmonologist. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. So why don't we go through some more trach parts? You mentioned outer cannula. What is that? There's this thing called the outer cannula, which attaches to a flange or face plate. This is what you see on the front of the neck, the face plate. Often it has a strap or sutures that hold it in place. Okay, so the outer cannula is what we see on the outside and what we think of as the tracheostomy tube itself. It's connected to a flange, which is rich with details about the trach. Honestly, guys, they used to look like hieroglyphics to me, but now I use them all the time because at a glance, I can tell the size, the manufacturer, and the presence of that telltale pilot balloon that lets me know the trach is cuffed. There's also an inner cannula. So it's basically a tube within a tube, a rigid tube with a slightly smaller tube inside of it. Right. So the inner cannula clearly goes inside, but why do we need that inner piece? Shreya, the inner cannula is the underdog of trach tube components. That inner cannula is removable, which makes it much easier to change when secretions build up. And this way you avoid having to go through a full trach change. Uh, it's like the inner cannula is like the behind the scenes, come to the rescue, team player we all love, the true kind of MVP. <laughs> I'm sure we'll talk more about that in our next Pearl on trach emergencies. But while we're on a roll, um, something else I often hear thrown around or seen in one-liners is XLT. Well, XLT is extra long tube, but there are two types. There's what's called a proximal XLT and a distal XLT. A proximal XLT is where the tube is longer before the bend. If you imagine a trach sort of looks like an L, right? And if you have somebody who has a lot of neck tissue or swelling, you need a longer tube to get into the trachea. So that's where a proximal XLT is useful. So it was helpful for me to see uh, a picture that we'll put in our show notes that really cements that proximal X XLT being longer on one end, and it helps kind of get through all that neck tissue. On the other hand, if you're trying to get that tube farther down their trachea, let's say they have some stenosis or something, um, then you want to use a distal XLT tube. Um, and so that, that tube is longer after the bend. So to put this all together, I might say that a patient has a 5.0 cuffed distal XLT tube. And what that means is that means the size of the tube, the inner diameter, five millimeters, it has a cuff and it's a longer tube where it's longer after the bend. So two patients could both have a Shiley 5 XLT tube, but one might have a distal XLT due to tracheal stenosis, while the other could have a proximal XLT because of more neck tissue? That is exactly right. Uh, it feels so good to actually understand most of that. He mentioned 
the trach being cuffed. So let's break that down a bit more. What does it mean when a trach is cuffed? What this means is that there is a balloon on the end of the tube, which you can inflate, which holds it securely in the trachea. And this is important for two reasons. Um, one, it creates a firm seal so you can apply positive pressure. Imagine if you didn't have that balloon. So if you tried to hook this person up to a ventilator and give them positive pressure, all that air would just come out, out around the sides and out their vocal cords. Oh, and all that leak would be no bueno. So basically, when we have to ventilate, cuff up. One thing to watch out for is when you inflate the cuff, the cuff pressure rises. But if you put in too much pressure, that's going to cause necrosis, which leads to tracheomalacia, basically making the trachea pretty floppy. And that kicks off a vicious cycle. Because when that trachea is all floppy, what are you going to do to make sure the trach still has that seal that you need to ventilate? You're going to increase the cuff pressure more, right? And that's going to cause more necrosis and lead to more tracheomalacia. The key is you want to find the pressure that allows you to um, secure the trach in there and get a good seal without having so much pressure that it causes injury. So we want to find that gold lock zone with cuff pressure, just enough to secure the trach, but not so much as to cause tracheal necrosis. Yeah, all of our finding that Goldilocks zone. But besides getting like a good seal for that positive pressure ventilation, are there any other purposes for having the cuff up in a trach? It protects them a little bit from secretions from above. Not a lot. Secretions will still pool there and still get around it. Right. So if that cuff is kind of like a balloon sitting in the trachea, I can see how having a balloon inflated creates a physical barrier and it's going to prevent some of those large aspiration events. That's right, Shreya. But buyer beware, cuff inflation is kind of like a double-edged sword with aspiration. Like, yes, on one hand, an inflated cuff is a physical barrier to large amounts of secretions. But on the other hand, that cuff also interferes with the way our patients swallow, which annoyingly can actually increase the risk of aspiration over time. Contrary to what I learned that um, the cuff inflation helps to prevent aspiration. Actually, no, it's, it's, it's been found, uh, mainly research done by speech language pathologists have shown that the risk of, of aspiration increases with increasing cuff pressures. That's Dr. Linda Morris, a clinical nurse specialist in tracheostomy care at the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab and associate professor at Northwestern, and notably the co-author of the book, The Tracheostomy's The Complete Guide. That's a lot of us hyping up cuff trachs, but don't you worry. We're going to be talking all about taking the cuff down and cuffless trachs soon enough in Pearls 4 and 5. Right. So I think it's time for a review of all that info. Let's do it. Trachs are complicated. And that's probably my biggest <laughs> takeaway. But to summarize, oh, we talked about different parts to a trach tube, like an outer cannula and an inner cannula, which is removable and will be so helpful when we are troubleshooting in Pearl 2. Since prepping for this episode, I've also been looking out for face plates that tell us the manufacturer, a number that tells you the trach size, and if the trach has extra components like XLT or extra long proximal or distal segments. Finally, we talked about trachs that have cuffs attached, which can be inflated for positive pressure ventilation, but comes with its own disadvantages like aspiration risk and tracheal injury, especially when that cuff pressure gets too high. Okay, now that you understand the different parts of the trach your patient has, let's say you get a page from the nurse that your patient with a trach does not look well and he thinks something is up with the trach and wants you to come take a look. This is probably the scariest part of trach care for me and probably many other people because my brain just like draws a blank trying to remember anything from one of those trach complication lectures I got way back when. And in that moment yeah. of brain going blank, we just got to take a step back and remember, context is key. The very first step is to figure out why they have the trach in the first place. The most common is somebody who has an endotracheal tube in and we're trying to get them off of the ventilator. Um, there are also people who have a chronic need for um, mechanical ventilation. So people with like neuromuscular weakness where they, they don't have good control of their respiratory muscles. Okay, okay. So we manage trachs differently if someone is vent dependent. And if I'm trying to figure out why my patient has a trach, the first place I look in the chart is their respiratory flow sheet to see, is this patient 24 hour vent dependent? Right. 
Because if your patient is on the bent 24 seven, like say someone with horrible neuromuscular weakness or someone who failed to liberate from the vent and they're and waiting for placement in a long-term acute care hospital, then any trach malfunction is sort of like an emergent airway. It's a big deal. Yeah, so I guess if the patient is 24-7 vent dependent, I should be thinking, okay, how am I going to quickly going to help this patient ventilate from above, i.e. help them breathe from their nose and mouth? Right. But on the other end of the spectrum is that patient who has a trach who doesn't need to be on the vent 24-7. And there's also people where you'll see they have trouble clearing secretions, like people with vocal cord paralysis, stroke. And for them, the, the tracheotomy is just preventing stuff from above getting down into their lungs. Some other non-vent dependent patients with trachs, maybe those who are recovering from COVID infection or who are just riding out trach collar all day, getting better, making that slow and steady progress. And just to clarify, so everyone's on the same page, what's a trach collar? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Trach collar is like a humidified nasal cannula, but delivered through the trach. So if that patient has a trach complication, we may have a little bit more time so that we can think before we have to just jump and act. Now, another important branch point to kind of throw into the mix And in addition to thinking about if they're vent dependent or not, we also have to ask ourselves when that patient's trach was placed and if it's considered an early or a mature trach. So that first trach will be in for, let's say, 10 days to two weeks. And then the the service or the person who placed it will come to the bedside and they will exchange it. After that, after that first exchange, um, pretty much anyone can manipulate it. Because at the, after that point, it's considered to be a mature tracheostomy. So in other words, a mature tracheostomy is one where the tract has epithelialized, which usually takes about five to eight days. But you can feel safe manipulating or exchanging the trach once it's been in for two weeks or so. And you should still check at your institution because there's probably a safety policy about those tracheostomy changes. And each place handles it a little bit differently. For example, at my hospital, my quick and dirty is to look for sutures, which come out around day 10 as an indicator of trach maturity. That's a pretty neat trick. And so with that setup of thinking uh, whether a trach is early or late, let's start to tackle some of our three major complications. The first one on deck, let's say you're called to the bedside for an accidental decannulation, which is just a fancy way of saying the whole trach came out of the stoma. So the key thing to understand is that if somebody has an early trach, it has not yet been exchanged, and that trach comes out, You should ventilate them from above. You should prepare to intubate them from above. You should not try to put that tube back in yourself. And the reason is, is that if you try to do that, you will put that tube in the wrong place and you will end up ventilating their mediastinum, not their lungs. So if this new or early trach falls out and you reinsert the trach, you run a high risk of creating a false tract. And if you ventilate through that false tract, you're going to cause new mediastinum or even a tension pneumothorax. And worst of all, you're not even going to be providing effective respiratory support to your patient. Okay, so bottom line, new trach falls out, do not replace it. And if the patient is ventilator dependent, we should really prep to intubate them. So what about mature trachs? What if a trach comes out in a patient who has a mature tract? Compare that to if somebody decannulates and it's a mature trach. It's already banged. Um, This is a situation where it's, it's also an emergency. You need to secure their airway. Um, you should ventilate them, oxygenate them from above. But you can attempt to replace it. Um, you may want to use a one size smaller tube because it may be easier. Um, but this is a situation where, you know, this is, this is potentially not an emergency this is, or potentially not an airway code emergency where you need to get everybody to the room really fast. This may be a situation where, you know, people who are appropriately comfortable with a trach can fix the problem right there and there. So basically, when you lose a mature trach, it's safer to replace because that tract is actually epithelialized. But how do we replace that trach? You just pop it back in? That's a great question. And the answer gets into a component of the trach we didn't talk about in Pearl 1, the obturator. Yes, the obturator. This is something I always emphasize on rounds in the ICU. I pointed out it's usually hanging in a little plastic baggie on the wall to all my residents because no one ever knows what it is, but it's super important. Totally agree, Tim. The obturator is that rigid piece of plastic that you put inside the trach to let you have an easy insertion. Yes. And if your patient's trach ever gets dislodged and you want to replace it, you got to know where to find that obturator. Let's move on to our second complication. Beep, beep. Say you get a page about a patient with a trach, but this time 
they're desatting, and the nurse is concerned about a trach obstruction. Next, let's talk about obstruction. So let's say now you get called to the bedside. Oh, Miss So and So's trach is is blocked. We can't we can't ventilate her. All right. Well, this is this is bad. This is an emergency. People need to breathe. So what are, what can we do? Um, if it's early, things that we can do. So we can try taking out the inner cannula and suctioning through there. Um, we can also say, hey, let's let's uh, deflate the cuff and ventilate. Okay. So to recap, with a new trach, if there is an obstruction, we can think about switching out that inner cannula and suctioning. And then the last thing that um, that he said that I think was really important is that when in doubt, ventilate from above, as in help that patient breathe again through the nose, mouth. Definitely. And since we're ventilating from above, we need to take a moment and think about the cuff. So pop quiz, Shreya, mm -hmm. when you're ventilating from above, like using an ambu bag, should the cuff on the trach be up or down? Well, let's see. You said in Pearl 1 that uh, the cuff in the trach has to be up to get a good seal for positive pressure. Right. But there we were talking about positive pressure through the tracheostomy tube. Now we're talking about ventilating from above the trach with the ambu bag. So actually you want the cuff deflated so that the breath can make it from the patient's nasopharynx around the trach and down into the lungs. That makes a lot of sense. All right. So when we're ventilating from above with an ambu bag, cuff should be down. Noted. All right. So then how does managing obstruction differ when it's an immature trach? If somebody is obstructed and it is a mature trach, now you have a few more options. So again, you, you can remove the inner cannula, you can suction when somebody obstructs. They have secretions that have become really dry and they're kind of crusted on the tracheostomy tube. Or sometimes the answer is to um, just take out the whole thing and put in a new one if that's an option. Wow. Changing the whole trach, that, I don't know about you guys, but it feels a bit invasive to me. <laughs> But I guess if it's a <laughs> if it's a mature trach, the tract is epithelialized, it should be okay. Right. I, I sort of think of this like rebooting a computer that isn't working, right? Something has gone wrong and I don't know how to troubleshoot it with the inner cannula and suctioning. So it's just time to change the trach. Okay. Now for the nightmare scenario. Our yes. third big trach complication. You get beep beep. You get a page <laughs> that your patient has bleeding at the tracheostomy site. Uh, let me guess, just like with accidental decannulation and obstruction, the management of bleeding probably differs based on if it's an early or mature trach. That is correct. <laughs> okay. If somebody has bleeding early, most likely that is bleeding from small from the skin or small vessels. Usually that can be stopped by just pressure um, sometimes that bleeding is not from the trach itself, but from the airway. So the person might have suction trauma. They might have some tracheitis. Um, these are situations where generally um, this will stop on its own with supportive measures. Um, you should be mindful that maybe what you're seeing is, is not bleeding from the trach, but bleeding from farther down. The other thing to remember is, you know, any bleeding in the airway could also be from above. So, I mean, this could also be like epistaxis. In many cases, it's bleeding at the skin around the trach. And in many cases, you can control that with pressure or um, some topical silver nitrate or some other measure like that. All right. Sounds like if bleeding is coming from a recently placed trach itself, it's usually controllable, usually resolves with some pressure, silver nitrate, phew, like I, I can breathe a little bit easier. But I'm curious, how does this differ when we see bleeding in a mature trach? Well, in someone with a mature trach, there is one rare but life-threatening bleeding complication to be aware of, and that is called a tracheoinominate fistula, or TIF. The incidence is less than 1%, but the mortality is close to 100%. Yikes, that does sound like a nightmare scenario. What causes a tracheoinominate fistula? So remember that you have this um, brachiocephalic or innominate artery which crosses in front of the trachea. And what can happen if you have a tracheostomy cuff up against the trachea and it erodes in the trachea and puts pressure on this artery, it can cause this artery to bleed. And this will cause a very brisk, very red, very scary airway bleed. Whoa, okay. This type of bleed will not be subtle. 
and your patient needs to go to the operating room immediately. Oh, for sure. But what can we do for the patient at the bedside to temporize them on the way to the OR? Well, the first thing to do with any worrisome airway bleeding in a tracheostomy patient, steep Trendelenburg to protect the uh, airway and overinflate the cuff on the balloon. Now, if you see uh, blood shooting out of a trach, the first thing to do is hyperinflate the cuff and try to manipulate the tube so that you can possibly tamponade that area of bleeding. If that doesn't work, the only other thing to do is to remove the tube completely, which seems crazy, but to remove the tube completely and put a finger in the stoma to try to pull forward toward you, the clinician, to try to clamp off that bleeding artery. Meanwhile, of course, it's going to be a bloody mess. So someone has to then take over mask ventilation, of course, suctioning, suctioning the airway, mask ventilation, and then, of course, intubation. And then worry about the, the then get them to the operating room immediately. So you're telling me that I can hyperinflate the cuff, and if that doesn't work, stick my finger in the trach site and pull forward to try and stop that bleeding? That sounds wild. Yes. Well, you know, the bottom line here, Matt, is that in a tracheonominate fistula, you have to do everything you can to achieve tamponade for the bleed because the consequences are dire, right? And so what works for one person might not work for everybody. Fortunately, this is an exceedingly uncommon scenario. But if you do happen to find yourself in that situation, you might be the one to save a life now. Uh, gosh, I hope I'm never in that situation, but I do think <laughs> I'm going to be a little bit less freaked out next time. Uh, maybe this is a good point to pause and, and recap. For me, I think the biggest takeaway, uh, especially when my brain gets a little fuzzy, uh, getting a page about a trait complication is to ask if this patient is vent dependent or not. And two, um, if it's an early trach, you know, less than two weeks older or, or, or so, or is it a mature trach? The first big trait complication to know is accidental decannulation, where the trait comes out. And big teaching point there, if an early trach falls out, do not try to replace the trach. If they're vent dependent, ventilate above from the mouth and nose and intubate if you have to. And with obstruction, we can try changing out the inner cannula, suctioning. And if that doesn't work and it happens to be a mature trach, you can consider even replacing the whole trach. And finally, the third complication is bleeding, which is usually, thankfully, mild and resolves with pressure or silver nitrate. But the thing to watch out for, particularly in a mature trach, is a rare complication called a tracheoanominate fistula. In an emergency, consider ventilating from above while providing direct pressure to try to stop the bleed. One big exception we should talk about where you wouldn't want to ventilate from above, and that is in patients without a larynx. Uh, we see a lot of people who, who no longer have a larynx people who have like a head neck cancer and they undergo like a laryngectomy, they'll, they'll have a tracheotomy because they need, they need an airway and they don't have an airway from above. Okay. Let's repeat that because it's a key concept. In a patient who has had a laryngectomy, there's no connection between the nasopharynx and the trachea. And it's actually really important to call out this as separate from those others, because when you don't have an upper airway, it really means that the tracheotomy is your only airway option. Right. So in patients with laryngectomy or trauma to their larynx, the tracheostomy tube is their only airway and we're not able to ventilate from above. So if you intubate this person through their mouth, all you're going to do is insufflate their stomach, which is dangerous. So if there's a trach emergency in a patient with a laryngectomy and they need respiratory support, you should put the ambu bag over the stoma while you wait for help. All right. Thank you so much for explaining that anatomy out. That really helps it stick more. Basically, big takeaway in a patient with laryngectomy, no ventilation from the mouth and nose. After that adrenaline rush of emergencies, let's shift gears a little bit and focus on, some might say the mundane, but I say the day-to-day -day excellence in trach care. I mean, this stuff really matters for quality of life. Yes. First, let's just talk a little bit about secretions in the patient with a trach. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think Matt and I just took care of a patient who had a ton of crusting around the trach and was just wondering, what causes it? So one of the main purposes of our upper airways, the nasopharynx, is to humidify air. Right. When you bypass the upper airways and you have a direct connection between ambient air and your trachea, um, your trachea is now exposed to really dry air and that can dry secretions there, which is why you get this crusting problem. Oh, 
So it seems like our nasopharynx essentially helps with humidification. But when a patient has a trach, we're essentially, by definition, bypassing our body's humidification system. Those dry secretions can thicken up and cause the trach to get obstructed, like your patient, which is why we approach secretion management a little bit differently in patients with a trach than in other patients. And that's because when we start to think about trying to stop secretions with things like glycopyrrolate or some of the other things that, that uh, we can use, that, that gets into a possible pulmonary problem because we're going to make the secretions thicker. And with a trach patient, you don't want thick secretions. You want to have the secretions thin and mobile so that the patient can cough them out easily or we can suction them out easily. Because once we start to try to um, stop the secretions by some of those agents, then we can we get ourselves into more trouble. Wait, what? I always thought we gave things like glycopyrrolate to help with secretions, but... I guess I was wrong. And I guess what we just learned is that patients who have trachs are already prone to drier secretions and adding glycopyrrolate on top of it is just fire on fire. Exactly. And one of the best ways to put out that fire and keep those secretions nice and flowing is H and H. I'm guessing you're not referring to hemoglobin and hematocrit. Nope. My excuse for a pun. Hydration and humidified (laughs) air. Hydration is important so that so that it does help to thin secretions. Um, And then there's humidity. We can do the humidity with the trach collar. And the other thing that's that's very low tech, but very effective is the HME, the heat moisture exchanger. Okay, first of all, I'm so glad Dr. Morris brought up trach collar because I don't think I knew the reason that patients were on trach collar was is basically helping with that humidification part of it. And second of all, what in the world is a heat moisture exchanger? It's an attachment to the trach. It can be circular, but it you, if you look inside, it's got little layers of filter paper inside. And what that does is it traps the moisture of the exhaled air so that you can re-inhale with the next breath, that trapped moisture. It's quite effective. Um, And I never used to have a whole lot of respect for the HME (laughs) because it's just, you know, a little bit of filter paper in a housing essentially, but it can be really effective. Okay, so the takeaway here is that if your patient is breathing through a trach, they need to have some mechanism to humidify their secretions. So give them humidified air, whether through a trach collar or use that heat moisture exchanger with the filter paper. And also make sure that your patient is adequately hydrated, whether they're drinking, getting it through the J-tube or IV. What about NEBS? Yeah, I think, you know, with NEBS, simplicity is key. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. Usually I just use albuterol for my nebulizers. Wait, not doing NEBS? Well, you know, duonebs can be great. More is more, right? Mm. But I do think twice about using it here because of the reasons we just talked about, unless there's a clear indication like COPD, because the anticholinergic activity of ipratropium can really dry out those secretions and make them harder to clear. And here, remember, our goal is just to use bronchodilation to mobilize those secretions along. Yeah, isn't that interesting? I mean, I think most people think duonebs are better because it's two bronchodilators rather than one. But knowing (laughs) what we know now... You don't have to feel bad if a patient without COPD is just on albuterol alone. But what if our patient is getting adequate hydration, is on HME, the heat moisture exchanger, only getting albuterol nebs, not getting any anticholinergic stuff to dry them out. They're not on glycopyrrolate. They're still having thick secretions. What do we do now? So this is where I'm thinking about hypertonic saline. The high salt content draws water into the mucus, which thins out those thick stubborn secretions and allows your patient to clear them. Interesting. You know, I've never thought about why hypertonic saline nebs are helpful, but I guess it makes sense using tonicity to shift fluids and thin out secretions. You know, I kind of wish there was like this ideal regimen for a patient uh, with a tracheostomy, like kind of like a bundle that I can just you know, click on for all patients with a trach that will help keep that airway nice and humid and prevent those secretions from getting too thick. 
If only there was a one size fits all order set, but alas, uh, you, you know, you can always ask your friendly neighborhood RT and pharmacist for input, but for my money, the best place to start is by just talking with the patient themselves. So often people who have had a trach for years know how to manage their trach. And so keeping them on the same regimen, whether that's meds, suctioning, using saline and then suctioning, humidifying air, like there are so many things that they have probably figured out. So don't reinvent the wheel. Remember, you can also use most airway clearance devices that you would use in a non-trach patient like cough assist or acapella. These produce oscillatory positive airway pressure to shake things around and get those secretions moving along. Got it. So my takeaways from this pearl are that patients with trachs are at risk of developing dry and thick secretions. And the teaching point as to why that is, is that air that goes through the trachs bypasses the nasopharynx, which typically helps with that humidification bit. So we can work with RT and nursing to make sure that they're getting enough hydration and humidified air, whether that's with a tray collar or a cool filter device called the heat moisture exchanger. And other things that we can try include bronchodilators like albuterol and airway clearance devices to loosen up those thick secretions. Finally, don't forget that patients might already have a regimen that works for them, so make sure to ask them about it. All right. I also find patients and families often asking me, hey, when am I going to be able to speak? Or when is my loved one going to be able to speak? I know I think it's hard to know how to answer that. When do we know that a patient with a trach is ready? If they're, if they're awake, if they're alert, if they're, able to, if they're able mechanically to speak, and if they're also, if they don't require the continuous positive pressure, then you could consider, you know, replacing a larger trach with a smaller trach and giving them an uncuffed trach and then letting them use a passenger valve so that they can speak. Okay, a couple of really important things that Dr. Mark pointed out there. We progress a patient from a large trach to a smaller trach and then finally to an uncuffed trach. By the way, all these steps fall under the big pathway to decannulation, which is taking the trach out. We're going to talk all about that in the next pearl. That sounds good, but I, I'm still stuck on what he said about that if a patient can me mechanically speak, what does that mean? How do we know that? So if you think a patient is ready to speak, the first thing you want to do is deflate the cuff or as the cool kids say, cuff down. And then you have the patient put their finger over the trach and try to cough. And if that goes okay, try to speak. Honestly, this is like my favorite part about taking care of patients with trachs because there's this magic where the patient hears their own voice for the first time in a long time. And guys, it's like super special. Yeah, and if all that goes okay and you're not worried about secretion burden, then you can think about progressing that patient to a speaking valve trial. Great. So speaking of speaking valves, how do valves <laughs> actually work? A speaking valve allows air in through the trach but it, the valve closes on exhalation, so it forces air around the tube on exhalation. So you're breathing in through the trach, breathing out through the mouth and nose. So with the speaking valve, the patient breathes out through their mouth and nose. And since that valve redirects airflow up through the vocal cords, instead of out of the trach, a patient is able to make sounds or phonate. Yep. And uh, just to reinforce that super important point one more time, when a patient is phonating, the cuff should be deflated or they should have a straight up cuffless trach. Imagine what happens if you accidentally put a passing ear valve on a cuffed trach and that cuff is up. Now they can breathe in through the trach, but they can't breathe out by blowing air around the trach. Right. So with every breath, they just inflate more air and they can't get it out. So as a safety thing, I really, really, really don't like it if there is a cuffed trach and a passing ear valve in the same room, right? Like in general, if somebody is, is using a passing ear valve, I want to make sure that they have an uncuffed trach. So in most cases, we want to avoid using a speaking valve with a cuffed trach. And there are cuffed trachs that are designed for use with speaking valves, but even with those, the cuff needs to be down. If you're in doubt about this, just ask your pulmonologist or respiratory therapist for help. Exceptions to everything. <laughs> um, this may be a good point to pause and summarize. So patients uh, who have trachs, uh, if they're off positive pressure, if they're awake, they're alert, uh, they're generally people who are have 
are uncuffed, right? These are good candidates for a speaking valve trial. And the reason why a one-way speaking valve works is that it closes on exhalation and redirects that air through the vocal cords and allows patients to speak. This last pearl focuses on a super interesting topic, the progression to trach removal. And that process is called decannulation. Once the patient tolerates cuff deflation, then we can start to think about getting them on the pathway toward decannulation. And that first step after that is um, doing capping trials. If someone can tolerate breathing with a deflated cuff, the speaking valve trial we talked about in Pearl 4, a smaller size trach, the next step is then to cap. And just to make sure we're all on the same page, what is a capping trial? Well, Shreya, a capping trial is exactly what it sounds like. You put a cap over the trach, sometimes for as long as 48 hours. Nice. It's as simple as it sounds. And remember how we said a speaking valve is a one-way valve that is open during inhalation? Well, Mm -hmm. a capping trial is harder because it's a two-way valve that effectively forces all of that airflow during inhalation and exhalation to go through the patient's nose and mouth. So put a cap on it. And that basically gives the patient a chance to breathe through their normal anatomy. And you can do this for 15 minutes. You can do this for a few hours. You can do this for half a day. Um, And this is a great test run to see how they're going to do with the trach out because physiologically, it's just like that trach isn't there. In fact, it's actually a harder test than when that trach isn't there because they've got this thing in their trachea obstructing flow. So their resistance is a little bit higher with that small trach in than it will be when you take it out. So if the person is able to go, let's say, let's say 12 hours with no evidence of um, difficulty breathing and no suctioning issues, that's a sign that they're ready to be fully decannulated. So capping trial uh, on the trach is to see if a patient can tolerate breathing without any airflow through the trach at all. So this is a, a good test run. Sounds like a pretty big deal. How do we know when someone is ready for that? So how do we know if they're ready? Well, they have to not be on the ventilator. Um, They have to be alert, oriented, able to clear secretions. And they generally have to have a very manageable level of tracheal secretions and and low suctioning needs. So if somebody is needing to be suctioned more than once a day, that may be kind of a yellow light or a red light on decannulation because you worry that, you know, you're not going to be able to clear those secretions if, um, if you take the trach out. Big takeaway here is secretion management has to be optimized before we think about decannulation. And that seems like a fitting way to end this episode. Yes. And the perfect time for a recap. Uh, Get it? That's a, that's a trach decannulation joke. LOL. I, recap. That's, that was a good one. That was a good one. Patients who are off the ventilator, alert, and with manageable secretion burden could be a good candidate for trach removal or decannulation. The sequence of events to know when a patient is ready for decannulation is first, see how they breathe with cuff deflation, then try downsizing in a speaking valve, and finally, cap the trach. Just straight up cap it for up to 48 hours. If they pass all that with flying colors, it's time to take the trach out. And that is a wrap for today's episode. If you, <laughs> if you found this episode helpful, please share it with your team, your colleagues, give it a rating on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast app you use. It really does help people find us. If you want to add your own tips, share with your colleagues, please tweet us, leave us a comment on our website page, Instagram, or Facebook. This episode was made as part of the digital education track at BIDMC. Thank you to all of our educators and mentors. A special thank you to our peer reviewers, Drs. Michael Brenner and David Roberson. Dr. Priyal Patel for the accompanying graphic. As always, we love hearing feedback. Email us at hello at coramanpodcast.com. Opinions expressed are our own and do not represent opinions of any affiliated institutions. Thank you. You know how to book flights and hotels. All you're missing is a tool to plan the travel experiences you'll have once you arrive. That's why you need Viator. Book guided tours, activities, excursions, and more in one place to make your trip truly unforgettable. Viator has over 300,000 travel experiences to choose from. 
Everything from simple tours to extreme adventures and all the niche, interesting stuff in between. So you can plan something that everyone you're traveling with will enjoy. Real Traveler Reviews give the inside scoop from people who've already been on the experiences you're considering. So you can plan with confidence. Free cancellation helps you plan for the unexpected. And 24-7 customer support means you can travel worry-free. Download the Viator app now and use code Viator10 for 10% off your first booking in the app. Find travel experiences for you. Do more with Viator.